All right, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to call the meeting to order of the uh, Finance Committee for April 26th. It's 9 a.m. and we have a very tight schedule and I'll make some ads it's at the beginning, but first I want to take care of the usual um, opening requirements. Um, and it starts with to announce that pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 extended by chapter 22 of the acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted by a remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by Zoom or by telephone. Um, no in-person attendance of members of the public is uh, permitted at the meeting, but every effort is being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. And um, I would like to now um, make sure that um, members of the committee can um, hear and that we can hear them. So uh, please respond as I go through and we'll do it alphabetically. Um, so it starts with Lynn. Present. And Bob. I'm here. And Matt. Present. Uh, Bernie. I'm here. Kathy. Here. Um, Michelle, yeah, I think, I, I, think I missed Michelle's in the listing. So Michelle, present, and uh, uh, Alicia here. Okay, so we have everybody present, and um, I know you. We now have uh, two others, uh, Lynn. I. Don't know if you need to call a meeting to order. Uh, I do. Um, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the special meeting of the town council to order. Uh, I want to check with the two additional councilors who have joined us uh, that to make sure they can hear us and we can hear them. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Pam Rooney. Present. If others come in, we'll note that in the minutes and make sure they can hear us. Thanks, Andy. Okay, and as I've uh, informed everybody previously, um, I will need to leave the meeting at 10 o'clock. It was an unfortunate um, circumstance that two meetings got scheduled in the same morning, but uh, the uh, Mass Mutual Association fiscal policy meeting at 10 has some very important agenda items for um, all municipalities, uh, including us. And so I really um, need to uh, switch gears and attend that meeting. Um, so at uh, uh, 10, I'm gonna turn the chair of, um, over to the vice chair who's um, prepared to then take over and um, uh, run the meeting as vice chair, uh, one of those responsibilities that goes with the position. So thank you, Kathy, for doing that. Um, just as a quick and, um, uh, announcement for the people who are from the Finance Committee um, who were not in attendance last night, the hearing um, to say the least, was extremely brief since nobody chose. Uh, there was actually, I guess, one person who chose to speak, and he was actually speaking about um, revenue um, and, uh, and things to do to get more revenue for schools and other things, but it was not regarding the budget that we're actually considering. Um, so, uh, it was not, and then during the discussion at the um, council meeting, there was really only one um, comment made, and it might come up later. Um, but it had, in, um, it's from a counselor who I understand is not going to be able to be present this morning. So I, um, that's why she wanted to uh, make her position stated last night. And it was really a, in the form of a question about whether we could put qualifications on the um, 
vote regarding the uh, capital project for the track and field. And uh, Sean answered the question basically saying that it's a uh, four kind of, that all four communities have to come up with the same motion, the same vote, and that we can't vary from the motion that is being provided. I think this is essentially, I don't know, Sean, if you have anything else to say about yesterday and otherwise we should get on to today. Yeah, maybe I'll just repeat my response and Doug, um, if you feel differently, let us know. But um, the question was, could the town of Amherst um, vote, essentially vote for just one of the track options, uh, modify the the debt authorization language to to vote for just one of the um, track options. And my response was that would be essentially voting down what the school committee um, voted because that's not what the school committee voted. The school committee voted, you know, the flexibility to pursue two different options. Um, does that, do you agree with that, Doug? Yeah, that'd be correct because the, um, yeah, the school committee authorization has two parts. So it has a flexibility for the school committee as far as a choice, but as far as um, what the towns can say, uh, it's basically a yes or no to what's presented to them. Okay. So um, with that, the only other thing I want to do in the way of announcements or uh, to inform members of the uh, who were not present yesterday, there were two things referred to our committee. Um, and uh, Kathy may mention this during the second part of the meeting. And there was one other issue that arose at the very end of the council meeting. The two that were referred were the optional tax exemptions, which is a standard item every year. And uh, we don't have to report back um, according to the motion that was made at the council meeting until June 27. So it really get, um, it's not anything that we need to address um, on a, uh, very quickly. Um, the water and sewer rates were presented to the council and referred to the finance committee with um, a directive to um, return by May 16 um, with the recommendation. And uh, I think that the thing we will um, do is because there was some memos in the packet that did not get to the resident members of the committee who are not on the council um, SharePoint, um, we'll get those to you, one of us will get those to you within the next day and we'll get it scheduled for another um, a subsequent meeting um, and uh, we can um, will fit it in um, at an appropriate point, but it's really not part of today's discussion. And the other thing that came up at the end of the meeting was that we had uh, previously planned on doing the um, public hearing on the budget as a whole um, on May 16 last year. It took a um, pretty long time to do that public hearing I don't know if we will get the same kind of public response or not um, this year. Last year was um, about the CREST program and it was a very important issue to a lot of people. So we had a lot of people in attendance, um, but um, we are gonna have to discuss alternative approaches. Um, and uh, there were a couple of ideas that came up. One was to come up with another date that is not a um, council date and not previously scheduled. And the other was to go ahead and do it on May 16, but to do it starting earlier at 5.30 is a, and so that it starts an hour earlier than the council meeting time. Um, and uh, that's, um, Basically, it. I don't know, Lynn, was there anything else from yesterday that I'm missing? You're muted, so I did, we're not hearing you. Thank you. Not from yesterday, but one of the things that if we have time before you need to leave, Andy, we should talk about is the process by which we're going to review the budget and assignments. 
Okay. Um, we'll do the best we can, but I think we need to get on with school because Doug can only be with us for an hour. And um, there was a number of questions. So Sean, I'm going to turn to Sean because um, he's uh, sort of collected, I believe, the questions that have been so far. Sean? Yeah. So, um, so Doug has uh, put together responses to those questions. Doug, is it okay if I just share the document you sent me and um, run through that those questions? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I thought we might do, given that I didn't get a chance to get it to you until this morning. Before you start, I'd like to note that Shalini Balmillan has also joined the meeting. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Shalini. So I'll turn it over to Doug just to walk us through. Um, is this large enough for people to see? And I'll, I'll send this document out after the meeting um, to everybody on the committee posting the packet. All right. So just to go through this, the sort of first questions uh, in, in in short, sort of, you know, what's going to happen when some of the money that runs out runs out? And, uh, you know, it's it's not unknown to us. It's certainly uh, something that we're uh, thinking about quite a bit and, and working toward. Um, you know, there are some, you know, a couple of things mentioned here regarding the CSHS, which is Community, Community Safety and Health Services Grant, I believe it's called. But <clears throat> long story short, we knew that that would transition uh, uh, away and we would have to carry those costs ourselves. So we're in a process of, of transitioning the staff that are covered under that grant uh, onto our, our appropriation budget. So we've been planning for that. Um, I think with the answer funds, the key thing to keep in mind is it goes through all of 24 and a little bit of 25. Uh, we currently still have fairly uh, strong balances there and, and we'll utilize those funds to help ourselves out as, as we need to. Um, and again, I think the key thing to keep in mind with regard to that is that you know, there's some, there are some positions and, and some staff that we are, that we are funding through that, that, that are about responding to the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic, uh, you know, and, and, you know, some of those things are the things you think about like PPE and that sort of stuff, you know, uh, buying testing, you know, or getting testing done, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of it's the other kinds of things, the implications and the impacts on our kids. Uh, and our staff and trying to, to sort of mitigate those effects and smooth those out. And so we'll continue to use those funds for that purpose as, as our first order of, of what we're trying to do. And then, uh, you know, the, the impact on our budgets uh, by virtue of the pandemic, they're more and, and more directly financial. We'll also use it as, as is the case this year, we're gonna use it to help sort of level level up our budget and keep our, our staffing and, and uh, services and programs offered to the same. So we know that money's running out and we know that, that uh, you know, we'll have to transition away from, from that source uh, over the next couple of years. Likewise, you know, we have the opportunity with School Choice and E&D this year to support our budget more strongly from those. Um, again, those will, will taper over the next couple of years. Uh, and again, I think we'll be in a that are, you know, it's an evolving circumstance as to what our need and response is relative to the pandemic. And so I think that's caused us to be cautious about and, and more uh, committed to a sort of level services um, and, and sort of maintaining the status quo in, its, in a sense. Uh, and, and that'll be part of the process over the next uh, year to sort of see what changes that we can and may need to make relative to our budgets to, to kind of keep us uh, financially strong as we you know, sort of lose these, these limited time source, limited, you know, uh, time resources. Um, so we're aware of it, we're keeping an eye on it. You know, we think there's some changes in, you know, with like the sixth grade move to middle school, it's gonna help both districts, uh, both Amherst and, and region. We think that uh, there's some declining enrollment that's gonna be a factor. So there's a number of different, you know, sort of knobs to turn as it were to, to make things, uh, you know, to get there from here, uh, but it won't be easy. I think it's, it's fair to say. Uh, so we'll have some some tough choices ahead as we as we move forward uh, in the coming years. <clears throat> the sort of second question, Sean, if you'll just scroll down a little bit, I'll, I'll get into that. It's talking about capital projects, and so I want to make sure to be clear about the pieces of the of the capital. You know, the, the budget as a whole has really for us three parts. It has the assessment method, the operating budget, and the capital budget. Uh, capital budget being the capital assessment is often how we refer to it. Um, those three pieces are all part of getting a budget passed for the regional school district. <clears throat> the assessment method, if we use the statutory method just off the books right from the state, we wouldn't have to deal with that. We would, we would uh, if we utilize that method, um, that wouldn't require a vote. However, we do an alternative method. Uh, so that requires all four towns to approve that. 
the actual functional budget budget parts where we look at uh, sort of what's the spending we're going to do uh, in each of those areas needs three or four towns to commit to it. Technically, the state has a two thirds, but since we have an, you know, four towns, you got to be more than two thirds, so we have to go to three quarters. So three of the four have to pass that part. Um, and depending on how you vote it, uh, you know, some towns will vote all three of those as three separate votes. Sometimes they'll vote them all in one vote. It, it's up to you know up to you as far how as far as how you want to operate in that regard. But but that's the sort of mechanics of how <clears throat> the budget gets passed. On the other hand, we have a debt authorization. That's a separate ask, but it builds into what our capital uh, assessments are going to look like over coming years. Debt authorization uh, is is basically a, a, an ask from the school committee to each town uh, to incur more debt, and any town has the ability to reject that. And so, if a, a, any one of the four towns rejects that authorization, it fails, and the school committee would have to come back with a new authorization. Um, if you take no action, that's a that's a you know sort of a pocket approval. Um, but that's, I, I want to keep those terms and those concepts separate because they really are. There's this sort of budget piece, which has to do with the assessment of, of capital costs and the operating costs. And then the, uh, and then the, the debt authorization, which is, is, uh, there's two pieces this year because we've got the sort of standard looking authorization and borrowing that we will potentially do for the future. And then the one related to the track project. Um, and so the debt schedule that separates out the projects uh, in, at the tail end of this, it's a pretty lengthy thing. So at the tail end of this, I've got a grid. Uh, it's similar to what you've seen before, but I've basically broken out capital projects over the <clears throat> next several years and put them in, in place. And you can see the impact of, of various projects on, uh, on the capital plan. I will say this, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things uh, we know we need to do uh, in you know, on, on sort of you know between myself and our facilities director and that is to balance the plan out a little bit. There's there's a there's a big spike in the next couple of years. It's just too big for all four communities to take on. So we're going to have to moderate that and, and move some capital projects around to sort of level that out. The other thing I'll point out is the the last couple of years of uh, that are on that chart. I've got like fiscal you know 30 and 31. Uh, that's not a full representation of every project. I only put in projects through fiscal 27, which uh, which come online as far as borrowing in fiscal 28. Um, and so those are projected out. It does include one of the larger projects. Um, I think it's the Windows project. <clears throat> maybe, maybe it's the roof. I forget whether it's, it's, it's the roof. It's, it's, it's so right there. I'm um, sorry. Uh, so the roof project is $5 million. It comes online. The Windows is, uh, is not fully into that assessment. So if you look at assessment, it kind of drops off in the last couple of years. It's not that last couple of years is not a full representation of the true uh, capital plan in its entirety, but I wouldn't lean on it too much. There's a lot that's going to change over the next, you know, literally months as I as we rework this a little bit and and as our current middle school roof project goes through the MSNBA process and we find out whether we've been approved or not. If we've not been approved, that's going to shift that project again. That'll be right require us to reconfigure our our capital planning again. Uh, but you know, certainly aware that. There are several large projects at regional schools that are going to need to be taken care of, and and uh, currently how we have them laid out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is, is going to create a, uh, an uptick in, in capital costs for all four communities that, that is not not able to be met by the four towns. They just, I, you know, I've heard that, and, and we'll make a a, a a a deeper dive into that and a, uh, try to smooth those out, level that out a little bit potentially push some projects off a little bit. Um, some are more urgent than others, but uh, you know, they'll need some, some more attention in that regard. Um, keep scrolling down if you would, please. <clears throat> um, looking at uh, some parts of, you know, comparison over time, uh, particularly to other programs. Other programs really consist of three main things. There's uh, charter tuition for kids leaving the district to go to charter schools, the choice out tuition, the vocational tuition, um, they're all dependent on how many students we have. Uh, the, the overall population of students has been pretty steady, you know, over the years. Um, <clears throat> uh, choice out is, 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 has a baseline of 5,000, but if the kids have special education costs, some of those are, are charged to the district. Uh, so that creates some variability there. The rate at which those special education costs are charged is set by the state and it has, you know, they take into account inflationary factors. Same is true of vocational schools. Vocational school costs are determined by the state. The vocational schools submit to the state uh, what they think uh, they need from a tuition of each student to, to operate their school. 
the state either agrees or modifies that, but they set the rates and we pay them and typically they don't go down. Um, uh, so some of the increases we see over the over the recent years uh, is is related to you know, sort of the inflationary costs of those of those uh, students opting for other kinds of educational experiences. With regard to that, <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'll pause. It looks like Matt's got a question, so I'll pause and have him ask. Thanks, Doug, and thanks everybody this morning. Doug, can you just clarify what what costs are we paying for vocational students, special education vocational students? Say that one more time. I'm sorry. What costs are we paying for special education vocational students? <clears throat> so, if you know, depending on the nature of the kids, so kids that are vocational students, if they have special education needs, there's some of those that are covered within the within the uh, you know sort of tuition and, and responsibility of the vocational school. There's some others that are then reflected back onto the onto the um, onto the sending district. Um, which ones particularly I don't recall off the top of my head. I just know we do get charged, you know, incremental uh, additional charges uh, in in some ways similar to the way choice works. It's not exactly the same, um, but there are some times when, when we do get charged for some of the special education costs. Um, sorry to not be more specific on that. I'd have to, to dig in a little bit and, and find find the specifics on that. But but <clears throat> if you don't mind, I would I would be interested just because this is like the one thing I do feel confident learning about. Uh, Doug, do you want me to add? Just from my experience in the past, there, um, it, it's probably changed a little bit, but there used to be an increment for special education students that was charged on top of the baseline tuition. Um, it was three or four thousand dollars, and that was at Smith and Franklin County. Um, and then there's even been some instances in the past where there's special programs at those schools, and so there would be a separate um, tuition arrangement for those special programs. I think I think it may have evolved a little bit where they maybe stopped charging the special ed increment at one of those schools, but um, but the, in the past that has been there has been special education costs for vocational schools. We need to pause for a second. Athena, you have your hand up, so I wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to note quickly. Uh, Councillor Pam joined us. Can we confirm that she can hear us and we can hear her? And and note that in the minutes, please. Uh, yes, I can hear you and see you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so the second part of that that question uh, in regard to sort of uh, budget areas and, and decreases in, in regular education, I think one of the biggest things in regard to that comparison between 23 and 19 uh, is really sort of this year, because we have a much larger amount of school choice. I mean, there's a number of other factors, but we're using a larger amount of school choice this year, and we directly apply that to our regular education costs. And so it it I don't want to say artificially, but it, it more significantly impacts and reduces uh, our regular education costs. So, uh, you know, in the regular education costs that you're looking at generally, and especially that comparison chart that's being referenced here, um, is about the sort of, you know, general fund, uh, you know, exclusive of spending that's done through, you know, uh, revolving funds like that. And so, <clears throat> um, in in particular, I, I believe for this year, and I'll, uh, you know, about four hundred thousand. You know, there's a decrease in our spending for uh, regular education payroll. You know, the decrease is like four hundred thousand dollars from the current year. And the thing is, is we are not changing the you know the number of staff we have, but because of a larger amount of of uh, of school choice, uh, you know, it, it reduces that that burden, and therefore, you know, sort of shifts the totality of our regular education. It's a bit of a when looking just at the, the sort of general fund monies or the or the appropriated kind of monies, um, it can it can be difficult to to represent that well uh, or to to follow the the reason why those reg regular ed education costs look so much lower over time. Sometimes uh, it's sometimes an artifact of of how we're using some some choice funds to do that. Um, Kathy, any question? Yeah, Doug, when you're saying the school choice funds, is that People who are choosing to go to someplace else than the our high school or it, or read or middle school or is that people who are coming in is that in or out because if if in we get money for it if we go out we pay for it so which which is what's the flow on the school choice so the school choice in this circumstance because we have that revenue coming into the district we use it to reduce the 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 cost. That we're paying from 
uh, you know, the, the sort of general fund uh, monies. In other words, the uh, assessed amounts that, that each town is paying. So it's it's uh, because we have sort of cash on hand from this resource, we're reducing our our uh, sort of uh, our, our general fund use in the current year in that area. And is that a do, can I find bodies? You know, so I don't just divide. 400,000 by 5,000, right? To figure out how many kids that is. Um, so is that, I don't need that number now, but that's, uh, is that sort of, Kathy, is that more children? Kathy, we yeah. could send you a, um, it's posted on Desi's website. So we can send okay. you a, a link okay. where you can see it's way more in than out. That's the one thing the schools have always been really good at. There's way more interest coming into the district than leaving, okay. um, but all of it's published online. So we can send it to you. Okay, yep. so that, that was just my question on flow of humans as well as flow of money. Yeah, thanks. Right. <clears throat> and there, there is some about the, in uh, a little later in this document, there's some, some, a little bit of a head count for the current year um, on number of kids we have in. Um, so let's, uh, let's move down to the, to, the, to the next one, which is the staffing question. Um, you know, right now we've got a level services, and so the staffing is level uh, from from this year to next. You know, the current seventh grade is a little smaller. The the incoming seventh grade or the rising seventh graders, uh, the current sixth grade class, a little larger than the the class uh, ahead of them, and so it's likely that we'll need two and a half teams for the seventh grade next year. So we'll hold our our staffing steady there, um, and then uh, you know, the, there was a question around the art staffing, and and as I note here, it's it's a bit of an an artifact of the accounting, it's simpler to apply, you know, sort of all of the ESSER funds to an individual as opposed to fractions of four or five individuals. So uh, in, in the high school in particular with the block schedule they went to this year, there were some needs around uh, the choices kids made, you know, to, to uh, uh, as to which electives and which classes they were gonna take. And so there were some small fractional amounts of, of FTE and a number of departments that we, we use some ESSER funds to cover. Um, we kind of lumped that into art staffing, uh, and and there was a I think the other person, uh, other big area that we put it into was a was a science position, I believe it was science, um, and that was the simplicity of of our grant and tracking our grant and and that sort of thing. I think the real you know sort of real question is when when ESSA runs out, is you know what and how do we apply that reduction? So you know if we have fewer students, we theoretically would have fewer you know sections needed, and we could reduce staff accordingly. Um, but it won't be necessarily targeted to the art department. Art department stay, may stay exactly like it is. I think we'll just have to evaluate whether or not, uh, you know, the, the staffing we have and the students we have and the, and the programs that we have um, and, and what, you know, what we have, and what we want to have and, and what funds are available. So we'll, when those extra funds run out, we'll, uh, we'll probably, you know, sort of slice uh, pieces of, of a few different things to, to actually uh, you know, sort of make up that difference as it were. Um, so it's, it, I wanted to sort of allay any fears that art was going to take a hit in a couple of years. It, it, it may, but I, I would suggest that it's more likely we'll have sort of smaller slices in, in multiple departments, much like we did um, coming into fiscal 22. Um, we, we took a, uh, we anticipated some reductions in, in sort of multiple academic departments, uh, you know, that, that we ultimately then needed to support with ESSER funds, but but um, it, it's uh, it's driven by students and their choices of what classes they want to take, especially in those uh, in their junior and senior year. Um, uh, uh, ELE, you know, the ELE staffing, uh, just to move down to that next one, uh, has increased. But there's probably a shift in model. We've gone to more, you know, less use of of what they call allowed tutors or or ELE tutors, which are ad hoc. Uh, uh, staff that, that come in and provide support to students to more of a, a you know a model that uses uh, you know staff that are on contract with us um, so that's one piece of it um, and then I think the other piece <clears throat> that you'll see is that there's just been an uptick in, in the percentage of students that are, are needing that support at the high school level so we've had you know it's a twofold uh, reason why we have more staffing needed a model change to some extent and how we're delivering those services and then also a, a increase in the number of students that need that support. Um, I think I did a quick glance and it, it's about a 2% increase in the, in the students that are actively getting ELE services over the last four or five years. So, you know, a 2% increase starts to, you know, you just need more staff to, to sort of meet the need. And then I think, you know, our model change also has more on hand on the, you know, sort of in the FTE count type staff. Um, 
moving into the revolving funds, um, you know, food services, you know, I think, you know, the question was, well, you know, it says it's trying to, you know, revenue should meet, you know, meet or exceed expenses. That'd be great. Um, we're not there yet. Um, we've had for several years, uh, straight up budget support to help the program uh, break even. Um, we were able in the last couple of years to build the balance in that revolving fund a little bit. We were able to, with uh, with the support from the federal uh, government for a larger amount of, well, for every meal served to be you know, reimbursed at the free rate. And, and uh, we were able to offer and provide a lot more meals and, and, and have a lot more support for those meals. But the long story short is we're not to a place yet where we generate enough revenue uh, to break even in, in food service. Um, and I don't know if we ever will be, it depends a lot on, on what the, nature and shape of the national you know school lunch programs looks like and how it how it changes over the next few years i think there's some strong push to to retain the fully free for everyone uh meal programming and and support for all of that that would be tremendously helpful um but it you know it it is uh it is an area where you know with inflation being what it is the food costs are are, are noticeably higher and so it's really difficult for this program to 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 break even it would be lovely to get there i think we'd like to i certainly encourage any and all opportunities when we're doing other things that require food uh within the district to to use our our food service staff uh and our and our food service capacity to to provide those things so if we need muffins for meeting or something like that we try to do that in-house if we can uh, and build that capacity for those those ways to generate small amounts of of, uh, of revenue to help offset some of the costs, but um, we're also in a place where our our equipment is you know the capital equipment we have is is pretty significant. The needs are coming on. You know we, we uh, you know the high school was renovated in '96, so some of those those pieces of equipment and you've seen it in the capital plan as well. But there are also some things we try to cover from within this food service budget. Uh, there's you know equipment we use in the food service that we try to pay from from here. So that's that's another area of need that we're we're always battling with as far as offsetting costs and, ex, and expenses is trying to cover some of those uh, equipment needs we have with some of the resources we generate through the, this program too. So, um, you know, it's an area we'd like to continue to you know improve our our balance sheet on and, and get a little better. I'm not sure how how soon or or how quickly or how possible it will be to get to a break even, but I'd love to. Um, Talking about school choice. Doug, yep. Doug, just a moment. I need to just note that Jennifer Taub has joined us and I need to make sure she can hear us and we can hear her. Um, can you hear? Yes. I'm Thank here. You. Thank you. Great. Um, speaking of school choice, um, you know, we, we definitely, you know, are, are leveraging our balance. I mean, the idea with having a, a revolving fund is you sort of smooth out peaks and valleys in income. Uh, and and also when you have uh, you know tougher budgets or or you know uh, or tougher you know circumstances around budget, you have some resources to lean on to to help out your budget. And I think that's certainly what we're doing this year. Um, we were able over the last couple of years to just by virtue of much lower uh, overall expenses, we were able to uh, not use as much school choice as we had expected. We had, we had expected or anticipated, and so our balance has grown. It's really you know you don't want to keep too much cash on hand either because that that uh, you know that negatively has an impact as well. I mean, you know, it's not doing anybody any good if we're not spending it. So we want to strike the right balance between how much we have on hand and and keep for you know good times and bad, and and then uh, how much do we leverage in the short term to to sort of uh, provide uh, the you know services and programming for the students. Um, next question on school choice. Yeah, it's a little more. You know, so there's a, a suggestion of how to figure out how many students there are. It's a little more complicated because of the special education uh, component. Um, you know, the, the state actually calculates um, an FTE. So if students uh, don't, you know, are school choice, but don't attend a full year, you don't get a full $5,000. You get the fraction of the year times that 5,000. 5,000 is the base number for, for regular education. Uh, that fraction of FTE also gets factored into, um, you know, the calculations for the special education costs. Um, but, uh, and, and it's one of those things, and this is another reason for using a revolving fund is that we don't really fully get the final numbers until uh, the year is finished and we're on to the next year. So, so when we, uh, you know, when schools close out their year in, in June, uh, they do a final reporting of all their students, uh, then the state sort of squares up the books on, on what school choice looks like. 
Uh, and, and in the new year, they project what they think your school choice is going to look like, and they make corrections uh, relative to either over or under payment to you on, on the previous year. And so by putting our school choice revenues into a revolving fund, those, those uh, plus minus by virtue of, of the, the time the state needs to fully square up the books, uh, starts to smooth out. So that's part of the idea there. And, and Sean, if you can scroll down just a little bit further there, I, I give a little bit of the numbers that we have for the current year. And this, you know, the, uh, I, I put a link in there as to how school choice works and, and what's uh, reimbursed and, and how the uh, special education is done. Um, the, you know, the state about December or so puts out a projection of what it thinks uh, your school choice is gonna look like for the year based on the October reporting. Uh, of all the districts in the state. Um, they then set the monthly money that they send us uh, you know, based on that, that number. Um, and so currently, you know, the projected you know, revenue from Choice In for this year is just shy of $700,000. Um, I can guarantee that will change somewhat between now and the end of the year. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll get more revenue, but who knows? Um, but you know the head count, as it were, at, at December was 107 students. Uh, that will likely change a little bit as we as we go through the rest of the of the fiscal year. Um, so you know you sort of see from this and the fact that you know it it, it will change as the year progresses. Uh, you know by having a, a revolving fund where we sort of put this money in, uh, we can kind of mitigate those smaller variances as as the year goes from one to the next. Kathy, you had a question. Uh, yeah, yeah, Doug, this is helpful for me to see these numbers, but can you assess um, with your 107, which is a mix of some special needs and some just choicing in, can you do a, what if you had no choice in at all? What would the school staffing be? What would the school expenses, what would that kind of what if? So the above statement that we've always been told, it's a at worst neutral and at best generates a bit of money because the marginal costs aren't as much as what we're taking in. Can you actually, can you do that assessment? I know you're saying you, you need an end of the year, but you, can you, after you finish out the year, can you do that kind of look? Um, it'd be a little tricky, I think in some respects because uh, at the regional level, I think at the elementary level, it's a little more straightforward because you know you have sort of you know, at least through fifth grade, you have a single classroom for each kid kind of thing, that sort of thing. It's a little more straightforward on, on sort of making that analysis. It, what happens at the secondary is because, you know, it's so dependent upon what kids, what courses kids take and how big class sizes are. And they vary, you know, you know, some classes have, you know, 15 and some have 20. And that's a big difference over the course of, you know, and, and so an individual student's experience might be 15, 15, 20, 20, 20, and they're, you know, they're five periods during the day, that kind of thing. So it, it, it gets a little hard to sort of tease that out. But when we're, when we're looking at how many slots to open, what we're looking to do there is to, uh, you know, uh, not create or, or require any additional staffing. Now, of course, we have to be blind to who the students are when they come in. So if they, you know, we can't look at whether they have special education needs or those special education needs may manifest themselves once they arrive to us. So that any staffing that sort of comes with that is, is, um, is, is hopefully covered by the additional uh, increments around special education. But we have to be blind to that aspect of them when they come to us. Um, but uh, Sean, did you have something you wanted to add on that? Yeah, I was just gonna add that um, it's maybe 10 years ago now, time seems to be flying by. Um, we did have an outside or the region had an outside um, group, I can't remember what uh, what the, uh, firm it was, but they did have an outside group look at school choice usage at the region specifically, and to quantify the cost of the school choice program. Um, Kathy Mazur, who is the former human resources director, uh, was sort of the lead on that project. And at that time, my recollection was they said the cost of our school choice program was about a 0.6 FTE. Um, so that was sort of our inefficiency by through accepting school choice students that we had an additional 0.6 FTE. Um, so comparing that to the revenue that was being brought in, it was determined at that time that it was the school choice program was pretty efficient and effective. Um, that being said, enrollments changed a lot at the region. And so there was always sort of the intention of doing that type of analysis um, on a recurring basis, maybe every 10 years, every 15 years or something to determine if the school choice program is still 
you know, efficient and effective because as Doug said, I think the goal is always to top off classrooms with school choice, not to add classrooms. Right. And, 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 I, and I could see if that report is, I'll try to see if that report is available on the website because it might just be interesting to look at. Because I might suggest you do it at the end of this year, once this year is closed out, because with the sixth grade moving up to the middle school, um, some of the, uh, we don't know yet how that will, what that will mean for art and music, the, the extra classes that some sixth graders might tap into, but just to try to, you know, do it. Kathy, you muted. It said the host muted sorry, me. Sorry, Kathy, I was muting myself. I accidentally muted you. <laughs> you're, 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 you're right. You're right below me. Forget that statement. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're right. You're right below me on my screen. So I clicked the wrong no, one. My, my suggestion wasn't for right now, but at the closeout of this year, to do an assessment, and then when the sixth grade moves up, look at it closely because the sixth grade may take up some of that. You know what you said on topping out um topping out uh, you know they're they're gonna have their own regular classroom teachers but they'll potentially tap into languages and some of the other programs in a helpful way that's why you're looking for that so i i think uh thinking about it in advance with a how are you going to look at it would make sense Absolutely. yeah um i we need to keep tabs of the pace that we need to move through the questions because we do have a time crunch if you have to leave at 10 doug and yeah I, I do so this this last one here is probably the last one i'll go into the detail the others are, are numerics that i'll just explain what they are and let you look at them but um uh, just a question on the athletic revolving fund uh, I, I mean i think the key thing with with that fund is that the intention was was primarily to support the operation of the athletics program and not as much for capital needs it does do some support of, of, of uh, some of the you know facility maintenance and 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 uh, and capital things. Uh, you know, for example, we had a fairly big uh, filter project at the pool at the middle school last year. Uh, you know, the the athletics budget you know and and its revolving fund helped contribute a little bit to that. Uh, in addition to you know the, some of the monies we've collected from from the you know the, the users of the pool and and uh, uh, some appropriate appropriated money that we had available. So um, I think we're, you know, we have been able over the last couple of years, again, like we did in food service to, to um, uh, shift some costs and, and boost our balance in, in, that, in that revolving fund, which has allowed us to hold the fees that we charge the student athletes uh, steady over the last couple of years. We'll, we'll do an evaluation of fees this fall and, and probably for the fiscal 24, uh, make recommendations on on uh, on fees across the board, not just for athletics, but any fees that we have. We'll, we'll be doing a deep dive because we haven't in a couple of years, uh, and the nature of some of the costs have gone up. We've been trying to hold off given the uncertainty of the pandemic on changing those kind of fees, um, but it's certainly one of the pieces we have to keep in mind as we look at that athletics budget, making sure it, it keeps itself whole and covers uh, the lion's share of its costs. Uh, in this last section was a series of, you know, sort of requests for some numbers of, you know, like number of SE students over the last five years, um, you know, the, the, uh, the staffing, you know, sort of changes in, and uh, in, in regard to special education over the last uh, few years. Um, and then, uh, and then the size of the special education budget. So I've just compiled those over the last few years. I didn't, on the last one, I was looking at it. The past five years and then one in five year increments going further back. I'm gonna to have to dig a little bit to get those those out, but but it just have, gives you a frame of reference as to what's what's going on relative to the number of students and the number of staff we have in special education. The one thing I will point out in in the SE teacher group when you see that uh, the pretty significant uptick in 22, 23, that's you know a fair amount of that's funded from um, you know some uh, is related to and funded by. Uh, pandemic funds and it's related to pandemic response and so some of that will probably uh, you know recede a little bit they get kind of classified in in, in the areas of uh, psychological support tier two support as they call it sometimes uh, relative to supporting students that aren't necessarily special education in a, in a routine way but in a in a in a different uh, uh, more day-to-day -day, uh, psych services kind of way, I guess is one way to describe it. But you, you, you notice that pretty significant increase from 21 to 22 of, of staffing of teachers there. Um, and, and like I said, 
fair amount of that is almost all of that is going to be covered by our ESSER grants for for supporting those staff and and their need may and I hope will diminish over time as the ESSER funds go away. Um, Ms. Pam, you had a question? Um, I, I probably misheard. Um, do you charge fees to students for participating in athletic programs? When you yes, said athletic do. fees. Yes, we do. What is the average amount of that fee? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, we have, um, we have, you know, a, a pricing structure, which I don't recall off the top of my head. It's, it, it, you know, depending on the sports, some sports we have, you know, two to, we have three tiers of, of sports and expense. So like ice hockey is one of the most expensive. So it's charged a higher amount. Um, there's a middle range and a, a lower range. Most, most of the sports it's in the 230 or $40 range. I think there are caps by virtue of, uh, you know, family, you know, a total family commitment in the course of a year or total, uh, you know, athlete commitment in a year. So we do put some, some boundaries on it, even separate from uh, reductions uh, for people who have uh, lesser, you know, means uh, available to them. Um, I resist using the term free and reduced lunch because you technically can't use that information to, to make a determination. So we don't, right. um, but we do have a, a variety of, you know, cost structures relative to that. It's a pretty complex set, but it's, it's in, you know, it's a couple hundred dollars to play a sport at our high school if you're just you know, playing one sport. Well, I, I guess I am I'm, I'm dismayed to hear this because from my experience, whenever people are told if you can't afford it, you can apply for an exemption. There are so many families that will never apply just out of pride. Um, so um, I, I, I am upset about this, particularly when I think about the huge expense that people want to spend on a turf field. Um, I mean, you're saying ice hockey is the most expensive. And I said, oh, that's why ice hockey is so white. Um, I'm just, I'm, you know, obviously I don't follow the athletics that well, but I, I'm expressing unhappiness and dismay that in Amherst, we charge students for athletic participation. We do, and we have for a number of years. I, I would, I, I don't disagree with you that I do think it, at times it suppresses, uh, you know, it suppresses participation, but I think it also is a circumstance though the way in which our athletic department, our athletic director and, there's, and her staff and, and our schools approach that is one to, to be as inviting and welcoming as we can relative to those fees and, and understanding and working with folks uh, around those. Um, you know, I, I know that in the past, and certainly I think this is still true, uh, you know, there's a lot of flexibility granted around that. So there are, there are times when, when students are, uh, you know, um, that the strict structure is not you know explicitly adhered to. I mean, I, I think this is a way to describe it. I mean, we, we endeavor for for uh, to collect fees from those that that can, uh, and obviously for those that can't, we try to make uh, accommodations as best we can. Uh, I don't disagree. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, when I was a kid in school, all athletics were were part of the program. You just had to, you know, the only cost that a given family might incur is a, a, you know the physical. Um, it would be nice to get there. The economics of, of you know this and other programs like it are, are just such that we've, we've got to charge some sort of fee to, to kind of keep the program running. And, and at the level that we have, we have a fairly extensive program. So it's uh, it's a tricky balance. And it's, it's you know, in order to put funding for that, that means other things would have to go because it would just sort of, you know, it, it, would, uh, it would be a, a factor relative to the, uh, uh, you know, other parts of the budget. So it's, it's a difficult choice. Yeah. Michelle? Mm. Thank you. Um, Doug, you said that there were three parts of the budget that needed to be voted together. I think I understood that right. Um, and that the debt authorization was a separate piece. I'm just trying to understand with respect to the um, capital projects and specifically the track project, just trying to understand uh, on this chart in, in a presentation that you made that's in our packet from last week. Um, so the 1.5 million, is that part of those three categories that you talked about or which part is the debt authorization and which part has to be voted in the, uh, with the other two aspects of the budget? Right, so, so the capital assessment is for borrowing we've already done. So that's the authorization to borrow has already been given and we've done borrowing, probably not fully, but we've done some of the borrowing for it. Um, 
So the debt authorization gives us permission to borrow. Once we borrow, then we will assess and charge that. Um, so that for the from the budget standpoint, the capital assessment and is is for debt we've incurred and costs we're incurring relative to those those borrowings that we've done. Uh, and then the operating budget is is you know what we've been talking about. Um, in this chart here at the, at the back of this, I basically took this is the same as what you saw before. I just broken out instead of grouping fiscal 23 to 27, I've spread it out over over more, over more time. So the uh, so the debt authorization of a, of a million and a half that that is for the four towns for for new borrowing uh, would not hit the the uh, the the uh, assessment until uh, fiscal 24. Um, Doug, can I just so, add one thing real quick? Um, and, and so Michelle, just so you under, understand how it all works. So once you authorize the debt, the town will see it as part of the capital improvement program. So once the council says, yes, you can borrow, all the towns say, yes, you can borrow, the, the, the regional schools will borrow. They'll, they just send us a notification every year of what our capital assessment is. Mm -hmm. And then we plug that into our capital program. Um, so this year, when you on May 2nd, when we present to you the FY23 budget, you'll see the capital section. There will be a line that says current debt. And in that current debt, we include the regional capital assessment because we really don't have discretion about whether to fund it or not. It's sort of like we borrowed essentially. Um, and so we plug it into our current debt line. We can give you that number separately too, um, or it actually may even be a separate line now. I think we broke it out a couple of years ago to be a separate line. So you'll see that regional assessment um, in the capital improvement section of the town's budget. Perfect. Um, it, it's, it's not really voted on as part of the regional school stuff because it's already been authorized. So it's, it's in this capital section. Great, thank you. And so yeah. just, just this chart, just to explain it, is, is basically, this is the chart you've seen in a, in a previous iteration where I've broken out each of the fiscal years from 23 to 27 into their own line uh, and the sort of associated assessments with it. Like I said earlier, uh, these totals in these uh, 30, 31, 32 don't actually capture all that we put on our capital plan because I, I didn't plug in the debt that goes with those uh, that would kick in uh, in years 28, 29, 30, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, as I said earlier, these sort of total amounts to be assessed kind of get a little too large here in the next couple of years. We're going to want to balance our plan a little bit to, to, uh, to uh, you know, smooth that out for all four towns, quite frankly, because it's, it's, it's too big an increase. And, and we know that. And Amherst is responsible for 80% of this, right? This is everything, Doug. So Amherst yeah. should get assessed 80% of whatever, roughly 80% of whatever these numbers are. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I didn't intend to, but I evidently cut off the assess this particular town assessments. But it's the it would be the exact same as what was on the previous chart. The, the uh, so if you look at the uh, you know town assessments on the on the in the budget book that you got, the that would be uh, indicative of of what you're seeing here. Okay, so look, I think that what we need to do in order of uh, where we're going now is, uh, and Kathy's going to have to take over at an appropriate point, um, but uh, the um, see if there are any additional questions for Doug that can be answered in a couple of minutes. Then um, I think that um, Sean probably has the proposed orders for the financial um, part that will, that the council will need to be voting on on May 2nd. And uh, so the finance committee does need to uh, take a vote on whether it recommends the orders as proposed. And uh, Doug, I assume you have seen the orders, uh, proposed orders, and if not, um, you don't have, you're not sticking around, Sean can send them to you. I haven't seen them, but it's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll look at them when Sean gets a chance to send them to me. I don't think there'll be anything that's surprising there. So um, I think that's where what we have to do. Kathy? Okay, but um, before you leave, Doug, I think what you said at the very beginning, um, that these are separable, including the track. So I my understanding is if we wanted to change the wording of that order, the one town not passing it being a no would send it back to the school committee and it'd be on a delay. Does that mean it, it can't possibly happen or does that just put it, it goes back another round? 
um, in terms of us. We could still do the operating budget and the assessment. We can move those forward is, but we would be delaying the track piece it, as opposed to, I know we're killing it, but we're delaying it in terms of it would have to go back. Is that correct? Right. I think what I, what I would say is this, is that if, if you uh, reject it, you know, let's say the town of Amherst, it could be any of the towns, but let's say one of the towns rejects that authorization, school committee could vote a new authorization at their next meeting. And so what happens when that occurs is that each of the, you know, a notification is sent to the four towns, the four towns have 60 days in which to respond. And so what we've traditionally done is tried to do it through the spring cycle so that we match up with the town meetings. Uh, and so the, uh, what happens for the other three towns because of that would be if we went into uh, a circumstance where you had a new authorization happen, council meets every Monday, every other Monday. So you guys could take it up easily within 60 days. The other three towns would have to call a special town meeting to take it up if they wanted to. If they chose that they didn't want to, they could just do nothing and it is approved. Um, but the potential is that they might. And so, you know, having a firm authorization might be delayed until they can have a fall town meeting. So it's, that's kind of how the mechanics work on it. Thank you. Other questions? Well, I just want to thank Doug for an amazing thorough um, uh, set of answers and explanations and that we will add it to the packet. I agree. And uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, Michelle, you have a question. Yeah, and I know you have to go, Andy. So just to be clear, are, we're voting to make a recommendation to the town council today without Andy's presence or with Andy's presence or? We're going to uh, have to do it without him. Yeah, we'll do it in three minutes. And this includes the track, whether we recommend the track. Well, oh, goodness. Whether we recommend the track as it was proposed, Michelle. So you heard last night, Mandy wanted to put a clause, put a clause in it to have it be specified for an option. So it's not a up or down on track, but if we change the wording at all, it's a down on what's been proposed to us. So they would have to come back with the new wording. Okay. Great. Uh, so does that answer the question? So I. But I, I am going to have to, to leave the meeting and turn the chair over to Kathy. Um, and uh, I think that uh, where we're going to go is um, that Sean will work with Kathy to get the orders that need to be voted uh, before you and explain uh, they were, were in packets uh, previously so that these are not unknown items either to the council or to the committee because they've been in pa prior packets for both. So, um, Kathy, are you uh, ready to go? Yep. All right. So, um, I apologize that this uh, problem occurred and uh, that I'm having to, to do this, but. Um, I am going to switch over to the uh, MMA meeting. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Thank Andy. You. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Don't hesitate Thank to you, Doug. questions, please. Thank you. Kathy, do you want me to bring the orders up on the screen? Yep. So this first one is the assessment method order. This is the one that requires all four towns to approve. Um, and this is the one that moves us to a full statutory method with a five-year average of minimum contributions. Lynn? I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. Yep, it's absolutely fine. Um, I recommend that the, I recommend that the town council ap approve order FY23, Dash zero one, an order approving the Amherst Pelham Regional School District assessment method. That's my motion. And can, can I just ask, Lynn, you meant that the Finance Committee recommend, right? Finance Committee recommend that the Town Council approve. Thank you. Uh, do I hear a second? Second. Also, Michelle seconds. 
Okay, I will um, call a vote. And, well, first, let me ask if there's any discussion. I can't raise, I shouldn't raise my hand anymore. I'm chair. Is there any discussion? I'm not seeing any hands up, then I will do a vote first among the voting council members, and then I will ask each of the resident members whether they support it. Uh, Lynn? Yes. Kathy is a yes. Michelle? Yes. And Alicia, Alicia is Alicia still here? Yes. Yes. Um, one, two, three. So the four counselors, I've captured all of us. Um, Bernie Kubiak? Support it. Matt? I support. And Bob? I don't see Bob. Is Bob still here? Yeah, he's muted. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, I support. Okay, I've just got to make my screen big enough to see everyone. Okay. <laughs> So it, it passes for voting with one absent and all three non-voting members support it. I'm ready to make the next motion. Okay. I move that the finance committee recommend that the town council approve Appropriation and Transfer Order FY23-02, Amherst Pelham Regional School District Budget Assessment. Shane seconds. Is there, does anyone have any comments, questions? I'd like to just make a comment that I appreciate the fact that the school district came in at the designated uh, finance committee guidelines as approved by the council. I don't see any other hands. So then we proceed to a vote. Lynn Griesmer. Approve. Kathy is an approval. Uh, let me, Michelle. Yes. Alicia. Yes. Bob Hegner. I support. Bernie Kubiak. Board. And Matt Holloway. Support. It is approved unanimously with one counselor absent. And here's the third order. And this one is specific to the capital authorization. Right, and I'm ready to make a motion on this. Go ahead, Lynn. I move that the Finance Committee recommend to the Town Council approval of order FY23 03A, Amherst Pelham Regional School District Capital Budget, Capital Debt Authorization. Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion on this financial order? Michelle. I'm really sorry. Um, I just want to make sure I understand what we're doing here. So the track has now been separated out from this? Yeah. Correct. Okay. So we're only voting on these items that we can see here. And okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this order? Seeing none, we'll proceed to a vote. Lynn Griesmer. Approve. Kathy is an approval. Uh, Michelle Miller. Yes. And Alicia. Yes. Bernie Kubiak. Support. Bob Hegner. Support it. And Matt Holloway. Support. It's unanimous with one uh, council member missing, absent. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, Lynn, go ahead. I move that the Finance Committee um, recommend to the Town Council approval of Order FY23 03B Amherst Pelham Regional School District Capital Debt 
authorization. Is there a second? This is the track and field. <laughs> right. I can second it, but I, 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 I <laughs> So, Kathy, can I speak to this one a little bit? I need some help here. <laughs> so, so, I think it's helpful just to kind of like frame sure. what, what they voted and then what next steps could possibly be. So, um, the regional schools voted um, the 1.5 million if they set a target of somewhere around January 16th, where if the member towns raise the additional funds that are outlined um, in their motion. Um, that the regional schools could then pursue the larger project. If by that date, the, the member towns have not raised those additional funds, they would revert back to the smaller project. Um, the reason why they've done this and talking with Mike and Doug is that the track is in dire need of replacement. I mean, it was in dire need when I was there. And the reason is that this project was always on the horizon and getting geared up to do it. Um, but it is, I, I think everyone who's walked the track knows it is in dire need of replacement and that we can't, uh, as a town, we really don't want it to keep getting pushed down the, down the road. Um, so they've, they've taken this action to give themselves the option to pursue the larger project if the four towns support it. And if the four towns don't support the larger project, then to go with the smaller. Um, let's say, for example, Amherst chooses that, no, we wanna go for the larger project. Um, you could vote it down. It would go back to the regional school committee. The regional school committee could say, all right, we're gonna just vote the, the wording with the larger project. That would then have to go to the four towns. If one of the small towns doesn't wanna do it, they could vote against it and then it doesn't happen um, unless Amherst decides they want to pay more than, their sh than what the regional agreement calls for. So I think the, reason, the way they've done this is they've kind of tried to cover both bases and do it as quickly as possible so that if there is support in all four towns, it can move forward. If there isn't support, they can still move forward with a larger project. Um, but it, just be aware that any town, if, if they don't wanna do this larger project, regardless of what Amherst votes, can tank that debt authorization. Um, it requires all four towns to approve. So the only way Amherst could really, if it wanted to push the larger project would be if it was gonna fund more than what the regional agreement calls for. Um, and we haven't discussed to date, we haven't really discussed that. So again, the reason I think try to create that flexibility to set a path one way or the other to, to addressing the track. And I, and I think they've openly expressed their interest that they want to go for the larger project and they're going to push for the larger project. Um, but ultimately they need Amherst to come up, raise the additional funds that, it, that have been laid out for Amherst in that track and field uh, PowerPoint that was in the packet um, or in the council's packet last night. Um, and, and equally important is they need the smaller towns to raise their additional funds as well. Lynn. Now, Sean, there was a very nice PowerPoint that was developed about the track and field. I wondered if you could put that up because yep. I think it helps give us all a sense of what the other sources of money might be and the expectations on Amherst. This one, uh, Lynn? That is the one, okay. and it's, it's that chart that's further down. Yeah. So the total cost of the, pro the, the larger project is about 4.7 million. Uh, the region has sort of created some targets for how they envision this project could be funded. Uh, the one and a half million, which is what is in front of you all uh, for recommendation now. Um, money from the CPA fund of each town, uh, grants or reserves or any other, really any other funding source of a million. And then they would have a fundraising target of a million. Um, so the, the sources that need to be in place by January 16th in order for the project to move forward are the, the CPA funding, the grants other, the local taxation. The donations would, um, I don't believe, have to be in place by that, that January 16th deadline. Um, and so if you keep going down, you can see what that means for Amherst. So that's, those were total numbers for the, for the project. Amherst share of each of those is here. Um, so for CPA 947, Amherst has already set aside about, a, has already, um, Amherst CPA has already given the region about 150,000, I think, somewhere in that 150, 160,000. Um, so the additional ask of CPA would be 
uh, somewhere around 800,000 um, that they would have to go back to CPA to request. Um, the donations, Doug has said, they just sort of artificially split that up. Um, it's not saying that Amherst has to fundraise its portion. There would, I think they're planning that there would be a large fundraising effort that would take, that would address all four towns, not just one town in particular. Um, grants other, I think they were envisioning this could be from either ARPA funds, reserves, or if there's any other funding source um, that each of the towns wanted to, to propose, they could do that. Uh, one thing for this group to be aware of is that the region um, exceeded its excess and deficiency um, reserve account. That's the region's reserves. They exceeded that in FY21. You can only have 5% for reserves. And if it goes, if their reserves go above 5% um, of their operating budget, that money goes back to member towns. Um, so they did exceed that. And so they're, uh, they're going to be giving the town back about $400,000, Amherst back about $400,000 this year. Um, so that's just a thought. I, I know they've talked about that would be great if the towns could put that money that they're giving back um, to them, if they could put that towards this project. Um, and then local local taxation is the 1.5 million. That would be our share of the, the debt authorization. Okay. And um, so I am assuming that the other towns have also gotten some level of much smaller refund based on um, the E&D. E &D. Yeah the E and D. Yep. Absolutely. And do you know uh, if those other towns are discussing the possibility of giving that back to the regional schools for this purpose? I know Doug is working with them on this, like he is working with it with us on this. Um, I don't know if they've said yes or no, or, or what their thoughts are. Um, but I know Doug's having conversations with them about similar stuff as he is with us. And the other thing I, I just want to recall for people, uh, or if you weren't there, that at the um, regional school four towns meeting, um, there was some concern on the other towns part about uh, this much commitment from their CPA, because in most of those towns, it basically is their CPA. There isn't a whole lot more. So, um, and then the only other thing I'm going to just add, and that is that uh, the, I think you should look at the donations and grant line as combined because it is possible that, for example, a local business uh, or a bank or something might give money to something like this as part of their community commitment. Um, and I have spent some time talking to the um, athletic booster club, I think it is, and they're really working hard on it. But that's those are the pieces that I just wanted to mention because of other conversations that have taken place elsewhere. This, Michelle, is, this is a big ask and a lot to absorb. Michelle, to your question earlier too. Um, so this project alone, if, if all the funding sources work out, this is how much this chart down here versus local taxation and these individual amounts. Uh, so for FY24, 128,000. That is how much would be added to the, the capital assessment or into our capital section from the region. So we already have an amount that we pay them. I think this year it's somewhere in the $300,000 range. This is how much would be added on top of that for this specific project. We try to maintain, we don't want that number to be too volatile because we know that, you know, like town buildings, the region's always going to have capital needs and we want to sort of keep a balanced stream of capital funding going to the region so that there's not huge spikes. Um, so we don't ever really want to see that number go to zero because that means they're probably deferring capital um, down the road, which isn't, doesn't always play out well. Um, but this would increase it, uh, add a big chunk to it. Um, and what you'll see when we present the budget is we have forecasted, we've built in a rising regional assessment, capital assessment into our five-year plan for capital, um, knowing that this project was coming and knowing that, um, and knowing that um, there's other capital projects coming up. Um, one last thing is this is going to, unless the town decides they don't want to do the track at all, this amount is going to be added in no matter what, because this is just for that 1.5 million which is for whether we do the big project or the little project, um, we're still gonna be adding in that 1.5 million into our, into our assessment. Um, so this, this number doesn't really change whether we do the larger project or the smaller one. So I see both Lynn and Michelle's hands are up. Are they from the first questions or is there a second question? Michelle? 
I have a second question. Yeah. Um, so let's say that we vote to recommend this and, and, and the, and, and the council recommends this, what happens? I mean, close to a million dollars in CPA funds coming from Amherst, um, is significant, I think. Um, and so what happens if that's not, if, if we've gone through this process, but then it gets to CPA and they don't approve that sort of funding. So if, if the town, so say the council approves this, um, CPA has heard this project once already, they put it on hold um, because they wanted to see which direction the region was gonna go in. Um, so if the CPA committee recommends it, then it would go to the council for a vote. If they don't recommend it, then um, the town would have to decide if it wants to identify some other funding source to make up for the CPA portion um, or just not hit its target. I mean, the, the choice Amherst would have after this would be do what it can to hit the target that's outlined in the, the region's debt authorization um, so that the larger project can go forward or the town could just choose not to generate any additional funds for this project and the smaller, then we would go to the smaller project. You know, the smaller, pro the smaller project, M Michelle, would be just the track. So the 1.5 is set to be able to do the track. Mm -hmm. It doesn't okay. stop, it stops the bigger project. It doesn't stop anything, yeah. Got it. Okay. And that all has to be determined by January 16th. Was that? I'll have to double check the date. I'll, um, I'll try to send a vote wording. I think it was January 16th, but I'm not hundred percent positive. Okay. If we, if we stop this, this doesn't even repair the track. Yeah. If it, well, if this vote goes down, then it goes back to the school committee and the school committee would have to decide what to do. Um, but yeah, there'd be no funding to replace the current track. Please skip to Bob. 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 Yeah, I, I, I don't really have a question as much as concern. And my concern is twofold. One is that we've known, I mean, ever since I've been in town, people have been talking about replacing the track. And yet we don't have any donations. We don't have any grants lined up. So I don't know how much support there really is outside of the tax base in order to fund this um, at any level. Um, and the second thing is, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, I, I have a concern that the other towns are going to just say, well, you know, let Amherst do whatever Amherst wants to do and we'll go along for the ride. So I, I, it's not a project that's well defined where we know exactly what the costs to Amherst are going to be. And that's, that's the concern I have. And, and, and I don't, I, I, I understand the need to replace the track but I just don't see that this project is fully baked at this point. That's my concern. Thanks. Lynn? Yeah, I'm gonna explain why I'm gonna vote yes, okay? And believe me, trying to understand how this all works is not, um, it's not easy. I'm going to vote yes, because I think Amherst needs to send a signal, one, that whatever happens, we need to repair that track, that athletics, whether we charge students or not, is still a way in which students get equal opportunity, regardless of ability. In addition to that, it also sends a signal to the fundraisers of the uh, booster club that we're with them. And if they can come up with a million or more of other money, then we've basically said, okay, we're in with you. This is a track that is not just used by our students. It is a track that's used by all of our population. Many, many people go over there just to put in and walk their miles, whatever they're gonna do. So as much as it's taken me a while to sort through how this is gonna work, I'm voting for this. Thank you. Bernie. Uh, thanks. I, I, um, you know, I share Bob's concerns about the project not being fully formed and uh, in, in thought through. It's not a secret that this track needs to be replaced. It's, um, uh, it's been there for, for a while and it may pose, in fact, pose a hazard. Uh, to users. It's, I would think, and one thing I haven't heard is this track is probably part of the regular phys ed program at the schools, not just for teams. Um, 
I'm going to end up supporting this because I think uh, this is a function of Amherst in particular, and maybe it fall off for the region as well. Our, our unwillingness to confront major capital projects when they first emerge and the time it takes, it costs a lot, time is money. And, uh, uh, you, you know, waiting years to replace the track means it's more expensive. Waiting years to replace the central fire station means it's more expensive. And so on and so on and so on. So I, I think um, the uh, uh, school administration uh, has worked with the school committee to come up with a, um, a half-baked compromise, but it's it's something that, that we can work with. And um, we have to place some trust in the fact that if they don't meet their fundraising goals. Um, they get they get to re, they get to repair the, the replace the existing track at a bare bones level, and that's it. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be supporting this, but with uh, with some reluctance. Thanks. I'm just gonna weigh in on this. Um, what Bernie just said at the end part of what he said, I think the school committee has to be ready to move forward with just doing the track rather than the bigger project if the money doesn't come up. Because one of the reasons CPA didn't move on the big, bigger ask this past year is it wasn't clear what the plan was. And that's possible that where there's still a million dollars of fundraising and if it's not there, um, CPA has, a, has had a couple other projects that were contingent on some other money that didn't come up. So their CPA money stayed sequestered. So it's a huge piece of our CPA money too, Lynn. If you take that out um, with the Jones Library, the debt that we Sean just showed us out for 20 years, it's that kind of money off of CPA that won't be available for something else. Not not a million, but you know, 150. Right. So so in supporting this, I want to make it clear that I for one would be supportive of the small project. I'm not thinking that the large project is you know what Bob you called it half baked. I'm not even sure it's half baked, <laughs> you know. But at least the, a quarter of it's baked. That the track is is here, and I think we're securing the track repair. And but but everyone keeps saying, but it's not really the way we want to do the track. So there has to be a decision that you're willing to. We're willing to do the track this way. Um, and Shona said there's a hard deadline on it, but. I would hate to see that we didn't raise the fund funds and we're still going for the large track, the large project. And two years from now, we still haven't done the track. So my understanding is people are prepared to move on the small project. Um, Sean. Yeah, I just, I, I just want to push back a little bit on the plan being half-baked. I think the plan for what they want to do has been vetted by lots of people. There was a strategic plan put together. Um, it's been you know five or six years of, of people sitting around just determining what are the needs of the region. Um, it was in response to some really terrible field conditions um, a few years ago um, where people you know we couldn't play on the fields because they were so bad. Um, it's in response to having to move the, the the ultimate invitational tournament to Granby because our fields were in such bad shape. Um, that we couldn't host it here. Um, so I think the plan has been fully vetted. People, the, you know, what it's proposing is addressing the issues that have been identified. Um, I think the part that why I get why there's some uncertainty and some questions is the funding piece of it. Um, and that stems from just whether the, all four towns can support that level of a financial commitment, because it is a large financial commitment. Um, so I think the region is trying to be creative and trying to aim aim for what it wants and if it uh, and what meets the needs of the students. Um, and if it can't get there, it can't get there. But um, I just want to be clear that the plan itself has been discussed for many years. And, and I think um, if there's questions on the plan, you know, we can bring in a lot of people who can speak to why it is the way it is. Bernie. It's the five or six years that bothers me. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think I would be very, very comfortable if the region uh, said, okay, here's the RFP that we're gonna release on January um, 17th, the deadline, funding deadline is the 60th. 
and it's gonna have a series of what ifs. And we'll knock out the sections that we don't have funding for um, uh, as of the 60th. Uh, I, I just, my fear here is that we're gonna get to the point where we'll be right on the edge and folks will postpone and postpone. And the, the, the one and a half million dollars we've appropriated will get eaten up by time and inflation. So, um, you know, I, I don't, um, I, I'd like to see this ready to go. And I, I think we need to be more proactive in the way we do things. And I think we, we spend, uh, we spin our wheels and spend so much time uh, reinventing things and we lose time and we lose money. That's, that's the point. Michelle. Yeah, um, what feels less big to me is the camp, the private campaign. And, um, you know, I think it's interesting when we're talking about asking residents to make donations to things. Um, you know, it's one thing for the town to support something, but then it becomes a matter of individual residents' priorities. And I just think about it like from an equitable standpoint, you know. Um, what sorts of campaigns are happening for what sorts of priorities and and projects and who might have more ability to promote certain things versus um, other folks that have less ability to pr to promote certain projects and so to me this is just interesting seeing how this is going to require a private campaign that doesn't seem uh, I mean, we, we're going to be asking a lot of our community. We have the library campaign that's happening. There's there are other asks um, that uh, we're making to the community, and so I, I just, without really understanding what that campaign looks like, um, it just it's it's a little bit concerning to me, and sort of the power structures in place and and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to voice that. Dorothy, and, and I am conscious of time. Um, Amy and Guilford have joined us uh, and we have at least one other item. So Dorothy, if you can keep it short, because I think we need to put this to a vote. I just want to make a statement that I am against artificial turf. It has, uh, it is so contrary to other values that Amherst holds in terms of our relationship with nature. Artificial turf is very dangerous to many people, those with sensitive skin conditions. You can get MRSA and other things from abrasions with artificial turf. So I, I see the, that whole idea as really not what we wanna do. I certainly support fixing the track and making it uh, open and accessible to the students and uh, to the townspeople. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Are there any other committee comments or are we ready to put this to a vote? Uh, seeing none, um, Dorothy, is your hand back down now? Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, vote yes is, um, this has already been, it would be the finance committee recommending to the town council a support of this. A vote no um, would be against. Lynn. I vote to approve. Uh, Kathy is a yes. Michelle. Yes. Alicia. No. Bernie. Yes, I support it. Bob. Reluctantly, I, I, I do not support it. I would support it if it were just replacing the track, but I can't support this. Matt. Support. So I think we did all vote. Um, I, I, my own vote, I guess one can't change the vote because I am in the same camp that Bob is. I'm, I would be much more comfortable with an earmarked ready to go project. And I think our report should reflect that. Um, So I think we have done the regional school budget and the capital authorization. Kathy, do you wanna ask Alicia if she wants anything on the record regarding her vote? Alicia, um, we're, we're, when we write up why there was a no, um, 
you know, we have some, Bob has spoken, but would you like to say a few words of your opposition? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, basically I'm, I'm in the same boat as Bob. And so not that I completely don't support the project, but that I hope that it wouldn't be formatted in this way and that we would go about the smaller project. I think I would be more in support of. Um, and then just additionally, it's very, it's very difficult for me to have conversations as to why we cannot like allow low-income students to participate in sports for free and then to authorize like such large spending on a project like this is really hard for me to back especially when those conversations are back to back um, and then just seeing the different ways that we talk about things is really unsettling to me and how we say like this is so important but is it not also so important that we figure out a way that all students can participate in sports um, and so those are like the two main reasons why I'm voting no, but also want to make it clear that I am not not in support of fixing the track. Thank you, and and we will show that in the record that um, uh, putting in a minority and the reser the reservations people had about supporting this particular motion. Lynn, I would just want to ask Sean: Does the school have a fund where it assists lower income students? to be able to participate? So the school, so I think just to recap what Doug said, the school has two tiers of subsidized rates or lower rates um, for uh, different income levels uh, to participate. So the lowest rates, um, I can send those out to the committee. I know it's, it's not free, but it's dramatically lower than the stated rates are. Um, so I can send that out. And then I think what Doug was trying to say is that they try not to let ability to pay be a a prohibitor of somebody participating in the sport. Um, so I don't know, again, I don't think that was well-defined or maybe as um, explicit as we wanted it to be, but I think that was what he was trying to say is they don't prohibit wanted, somebody from playing. Thank you, because I, I think the way he explained it wasn't as clear as you're making it now. Yeah, I'll send the, the fee schedule with the lower, with the different tiers of rates out to people so you can get a sense of it. Thank you. Dorothy, your hand is up. Very briefly, a student who is very, very good athletically and of low income, they will find a way to pay that athlete's fees. A student who doesn't even know if they're good, hasn't tried that hard, but would like to try and is of low income, I bet that student doesn't get the chance to participate. I think it's really an open to everybody when it doesn't cost them anything. That's I, I, I just feel very strong and very upset to hear about these fees. Thank you. So I think that concludes agenda item one, which is the regional budget and debt authorization. And I see that Amy and Guilford are both here. Are we ready to move to uh, a discussion of water regulations. And I know there was one other, there was a request to do rental registration fee today because that needs to be decided on. We are at 1034. So um, uh, I hate Kathy, to keep, yes. Kathy, maybe um, if you're okay with check with the committee to see if they're available to stay till 1115 or 1130. Yeah, that's if, what I was just going to ask. Can we stay 15 minutes more so we can get um, 15 minutes to a half an hour longer so we can get through these two items? And Is if that not, we, we can we can let Rob go if um, if, if the committee can't stay late. Because Rob is here as well. It, do I need we need to keep at least the voting members here, but can people stay for an extra half an hour to this morning? It, Kathy, I also think it's very important we talk about the hearing and also assignments for the budget. Yep. Whether or not all of the members of the committee can make the finance committee meetings as scheduled for the month of May. Kathy, so it was my understanding that the rental permit didn't need, the fee structure didn't need to be discussed today in full. Um, I saw Andy wrote that in an email to us. So I don't know if I yep. got that wrong, but it could be discussed during one of our 
uh, May meetings, it would have to be discussed before the 16th. Before the 16th, right. So it could either be on the 3rd or the 10th or the 3rd, the 10th or the 12th. So it could be later. Because I can only stay until about 1120. So if that. Okay, so let's, let's, um, so we're trying to do what we have to get done today. Um, Amy and Guilford have been postponed once already. Um, if we, we could let Rob go and have him, if Andy can make time on the first week of May, then we didn't have to do rental registration fees today. So let me just see how quickly we can get through, how far we can get by 1120, I think. And I'm looking, we have, uh, we have one public appen appen attendee, so we may be able to do that quickly and we don't have to do minutes. Um, so Guilford and Amy, Welcome back. Um, so we had we had a few questions on this is not the rates, but this is regulations. We had um, a couple questions that were related, I think, that were sent on them. And um, I'm just looking. I know Lynn raised them both, but the the big issue that we wanted to have a discussion on was the if um, a water main, a water line needs to be repaired and it's running under the road, it gets assessed to the person, the home, or does it just get from the road to the home? And that was raised on if we change the policy, what kind of impact it would have on rate structures, I think was uh, the questions. Lynn, those are the ones that Andy relayed to me as the questions that have been raised on the regulations. And if anyone else had any others, um, they should uh, talk about them. Basically, the questions I asked were, what would be the cost to the town and the timeline of, move, of changing our regulations so that we would either pay from the main line to the property line or from the main line to the uh, meter? And the reason I asked that is because that is what other towns, not all other towns have done, but clearly it would have a serious cost involved. And there has to be a recognition that if we did this for residents, how are we going to handle our higher ed institutions? Uh, because we are their water and sewer uh, providers as well. But this comes from the various residents who have brought to our attention uh, the bills that they have absorbed um, for water and sewer line breaks. Uh, Bob, are you speaking to this or should we get a response for them on? Yeah, I can, I, can, um, I, I want to raise some other issues, so I can wait. Okay, so let's do this issue first. So Good, good, good morning. It's still morning time. Yes. So uh, when we talked last time, um, we kind of gave you a per foot cost of doing a repair. And we said it's around $200,000. We would need to add to our budget if we decide to take on the sewer services, sewer or water services from the main to the property line. And it's, it's roughly about the same number for taking on the sewer services as well. Um, and, and that's just a, a basic rule of thumb and saying that we're gonna probably replace more services than residents do because we want to be proactive. Because as Lynn mentioned, um, it's how our customers start looking at us at that time and how we treat our customers. Um, if, if there's, we had two backups this week on the sewer system. So if there's two backups and if the town's responsible for the service, wouldn't you as a customer say, you need to fix my service and get it squared away? So we would be doing far more water and sewer service repairs if the town takes it on. So we use the number of a hundred 
So using a number of 100 a year, we came up with those figures of about two, 220, 220,000 and 250,000 additional we have to add on if we just did what was inside the public way. So we went back to a study we had done a few years ago um, and the average, average length of a water service in Amherst is 105 feet. So if you take that average, which that's the average, we have some that are almost a quarter mile long. We have some that might be really short. Um, take that average, that changes the numbers from 200,000 to around 2 million. So we would need roughly $2 million for the water side and $2 million on the sewer side if we were responsible for the water mains all the way to the property, all the way to the house and the meter and the connection. Um, and that would be doing, we figure we're based on the calls we get that we'd probably be doing a hundred of each every year. And that's just material costs. We didn't include, um, well, we did include labor in those too. We use, we use uh, contracted labor prices to do those. So that's material and labor. So that's, so that's what the cost, the ballpark cost would be. Lynn, are, it, Lynn is your, oh, sorry, go for it. I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, I just, I just wanted to bring up something else that Lynn brought up is, is how do we treat people? Um, are we going to treat UMass the same and say that all the all the sewer lines and water lines in UMass that are now privately owned by the campus, are they going to now be lines the town maintains? And that they, they have much larger mains, the boulders, the townhouse apartments, the, um, all, all the large apartment complexes, they maintain their own water and sewer as well. So, um, we're looking at adding quite a substantial amount of um, well, miles to the system at that point. So that's the other thing to think about when you talk about these numbers. And we, when you go from the property line to the house, you also have to worry about people's landscaping. If we're cutting through to replace the sewer line, we're responsible for the water line we're responsible for. Are we now responsible for replacing the invisible fence? Are we now responsible for replacing the water feature they have in their front yard? Are we responsible for replacing their beautiful special stone walkway? Does it, are we now responsible? And those changes the cost and we'll add to it. So um, just to add on everything and wrap everything in a ball, that's kind of everything right there. So just things to think about. Can I just ask on the large entities, the education, if we were considering residential. Can you make two classes on who's responsible for the under the road part or do you have to treat everyone the same? We can make the rules as we want to, I guess. So if we wanted to say, if you're a single family residence that's owner occupied, that you could, that we're responsible to the, for the, to the house. If you're gonna say it's a rental property that's owner occupied, that we're responsible to the property line. Um, the lady who has been spearheading this the most, she actually has a rental property and a owner occupied rental property. So, um, as people have kind of consolidated around her drive, um, she would be treated a little differently, probably. So, Lynn, are you, you on this topic? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, Guilford and Amy, thank you for uh, coming up with those estimates and uh, understanding uh, the impact on uh, our rates, because that's where these would be reflected, it would be in increased water and sewer rates, which right now we pride ourselves in being below the state average, as we saw just last night. Um, I do want to mention that uh, Paul and I, I don't know whether Amy or Guilford, you were part of the conversations with the insurance company that explored, that Paul has talked to, that does offer insurance as an option. But my other question, because I, first of all, I pretty much 
dismiss out of hand that we can go to the meter. I just don't see that as even possible. Um, did your numbers include going to the property line for the higher ed institutions and large um, complexes? That's just a single question. And then I have others. So pretty much the rule right now is, is we pretty much only go to the property line for those larger larger institutions and um, apartment complexes. We do have some, we, we have said we go to certain manholes or certain um, connections that are a little bit farther beyond the property line. But right now, the larger institutions and the um, apartments are treated that way right now. We go to that cutoff point and then they take over the rest. Okay. So, and then my next question is, I would assume that if the town or a contractor of the town in improving a road or in repairing a road caused one of these problems, uh, that we would then as a town be responsible for the cost of repair to the sewer water line if it was disrupted. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Okay. And I know, and, we you were... know, that, that happens from time to time where, you know, say when we did the Pine Street repair, I think there was a couple of service lines that were ultimately leaking and the town fixed those because mm -hmm. um, it was our contractor that did that. Okay. And then I guess the other question I have then is I would like to see some sense I know this will not impact this year's rates, but I would like to see some sense of how it would impact rates a year or two from now if we went to the property line. So the easiest way to do that is as a, as a ballpark, we use a, for every $100,000 we add in the budget, for every 100,000 we add, we add 10 cents to the rate. So okay. if you go to the property line, you're adding about 20 cents. Okay. Maybe 25. Are there other hidden issues related to either of these that create a greater liability for the town as we go forward? There's always hidden issues. That's the problem. <laughs> um, we, we just need to kind of figure out exactly what we want to do and be very clear and concise and document well what we're doing so that there is little... Um, ambiguity when we talk to people and they talk to us. Mm -hmm. And then my final comment, and I don't know whether this is going to be something the finance committee would do or finance combined with TSO or uh, the council at large, but there has been a request, not just by the person who has brought this forward to the town's attention, by, but by a few other residents, that there be a much larger um, hearing or public meeting about some of this to get more public input and that so i'm finished with my questions for the moment thank you okay so jennifer are you speaking to the, this issue uh yes because um okay i just wanted to reiterate i know that um that uh paul said that he was speaking i think with the league of cities about the buried line coverage and i i hope i know springfield and a number of other you know, municipalities in Massachusetts offer it. It's, I, I guess the contract is from the town to the insurer, I'm not sure of the specifics, but then residents in the town at a very low cost can purchase buried line coverage. And um, in addition to everything, you know, uh, all, all the questions that Lynn just asked, I hope we can seriously pursue that because I've been surprised, you know, just in my personal life, I know three or four different people that found out they had a leak under their house, didn't know there was a leak. You know, one, it was a $35,000 bill and she had insurance, so it was covered. But um, I know when they repaved Lincoln, a couple of residents found out at that point that they had leaks that they had to pay to repair. Fortunately, the town was already re had repaving the street, so they didn't have to pay for that, but it was thousands of dollars. And I would think just for the town's own protection, they would want as many people insured so you're not having to go after individuals that really may not have the funds. Thank you. So we're, we're meeting on the on this Friday to talk to the, the insurance provider. Great. That's great. Thank you. Any other comments on this issue? Then Bob, you are on. Thank you. I just wanted to 
uh, mention that I read through the draft regulations, both the water and sewer, and I had a number of questions, uh, which I wrote down. I sent them to Andy and Sean. I don't know that I need to go through them now, given the time, but um, maybe a couple of points. One is that um, I think that I didn't see in either of these regulations, maybe while well, there was one mention in the sewer, of any kind of administrative or due process uh, you know, process for people to dispute the town. And I think that if that such thing such a thing exists, it needs to be at least mentioned or it needs to be put in as an appendix. But I mean, is it just a lot of things where, you know, the the, the resident or the, the you know the, the the proprietor will be fine this or that, and which is fine, which is okay. But there needs to be a process around that. Um, it also wasn't clear whether many of the regulations apply to only to new installations or are retroactively applied to all installations. Uh, for example, I think in one of them, either the sewer or water, it said that. Uh, you needed to have as-built drawings. Well, my house was built 21 years ago and I don't have any as-built drawings. So I couldn't possibly comply with that retroactively. Um, and then uh, another general thing um, is that there's a lot of technical terminology in this and the water is less familiar to me than the sewer. And maybe uh, you know some sort of diagrams that would show the system and all the components of the system uh, would be very helpful to people because I don't know where the curb stop is on my property. I don't even know what a curb stop is. Um, and I'm sure you guys all do, but I don't. And, you know, I don't think most people do. So, again, it would be very helpful if there was some sort of diagram uh, where we could, you know, people could see what it is. Um, and again, some of these, especially on the sewer side, some of the regulations you know, are very technical in that, you know, you can't have grease more than 100 milligrams per liter or something. How in the world would a homeowner have any idea what that means? Um, you know, I mean, obviously I don't, wouldn't pour, you know, a, a, a thing of oil down my, my, my sink. I know that, but a bottle of oil. But I mean, what, there is no way for an average person to understand what that really means in terms of what you should or shouldn't do. So again, any way that you could explain that or provide some guidance, I think that would be very helpful. That's, we can address all those. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. can I just talk about a couple of these? So sure. um, diagram with components, I think that's a great suggestion because we do define things, but I do understand that to a, Somebody who's not as entrenched in it, I think that's great. Um, the the as builts, um, I'm only going to point out that as you guys are talking about who takes ownership, you're asking us to take ownership of stuff that nobody has as builts for, as you just pointed out, Bob. So we're taking responsibility for components that nobody knows where they are. Um, so that's some of the hesitation that we have with it. Is um, just, so just kind of think about that as you're thinking about who owns liability. Because we didn't have ownership, we don't have the records on where all these components are. And then if the responsibility is thrust on us, we're responsible for stuff that we don't even know where it is. And we don't know what it is. We don't know the size, the, the makeup. Um, and then the last thing about due process, um, that was actually something that we talked about with Paul um, and so it was a note that we're, we're trying to put it in there, but I think he was trying to figure out whether there was an overarching anywhere in the town, if you have an issue with something that happens in a regulation, whether, you know, like whether it needed to be called out specifically in these or whether, you know, the town has an overarching one. So that that's something that we're aware of. And certainly I, I think we want to circle back because you're right, like that should be clear. So thank you. Uh, Lynn and then Bernie. I, I just want to, um, before you go to Bernie, I want to ask Dorothy, um, and I think she's the only one here from TSO. Did TSO finish their review and vote, Dorothy? Yes. Um, the TSO voted to accept the uh, uh, 
to the, the motion that was sent to us, we said, yes, we're going to sign that, knowing that things are going to change later, because we had many questions about this and that. We decided it wasn't really the right thing to do to how to settle them all, because this was a temporary measure that had been recommended by people who had thought it through, and that the permanent member, uh, measure would be a little bit different. It's not a temporary measure. It's a permanent we're talking, measure. We're talking about the, Doris, they were talking about the water and sewer regulations. Oh, water and sewer regulations. Oh. Um, Andy, do you remember? I have to look. I, I, we didn't have any serious problems with them. Um, we the didn't, I don't I, think we had a vote. I don't think we had a vote. The reason I'm raising this is because the issues that Bob is raising, which are very legitimate, and so forth are the kind of issues that should be dealt with in TSO unless they're related to the finance. And so I'm gonna encourage Bob to make sure that we have a full set of those issues. And if you send it to me, I'll make sure TSO gets it um, so that they can consider it as they deal with the content of the regulation and bylaw um, and so forth. And I just wanna thank you for your thorough look at the bylaw. Um, I, I will say that's going to take a long time. Uh, I, I'm agreeing with you. And I was really listening to Bob thinking, oh, I'm so glad that he did that reading because we did not read it that closely uh, and we didn't finish the discussion. So uh, I think that that's very important to send it to TSO. So I approve of that. I, so I, I see Andy has returned and I, Andy, if it's okay with you, yeah. I was going to call on Bernie um, and we have extended, just so you know, we've extended the meeting time till 1120. Okay, uh, just real quick, because uh, it's uh, responding to what was just reported. Dorothy, we did uh, go through and uh, the, you remember Anna uh, took us through section by section on the water and sewer regs and uh, voted to recommend, I believe. And uh, we so didn't go through, we didn't deal with the issues he just brought up, though. No, that is correct. That is correct, but I just did uh, want to supplement the answer. So uh, back to you, Kathy, you're chairing and keep chairing. Right. So just to um, Dorothy and Andy, in order to consider them, you would have to move to reconsider your vote. Correct. Thank you. But Andy, I'm not sure that we, we gave Anna the full time um, to go through all of the things that she, because she had said she was going through it carefully. So I, I, I let, let me suggest we don't take time. Right. There's a history. We, you'll have a record on this. So we'll we'll come back to that. Um, yeah. Just being conscious of all of our time. And I, and I haven't seen Bob. Bob sent just as we've been requested to. So the rest of us haven't seen all of them either. Bernie. Um, yeah, I Amy, I um, <laughs> we tried at one point to locate our water drawings and the town couldn't find them. Uh, so I understand that. Um, and Bob, thank you for your thorough reading of them. I went through them page by page and have had to live with some of this stuff as an administrator. Um, there is no mention that I found of an appeal or adjudication process, uh, some kind of negotiation process. Um, so that, you know, uh, problems could be addressed or if someone has a problem paying, they could um, do it in installments as other, in any kind of ways, that, uh, some flexibility in there to give the town the ability to work with the homeowner to solve, uh, solve problems. Uh, the question that was raised in the presentation about new and modified services isn't answered in the regulations. And I think the town, um, from my experience, is not approved uh, or is not considered um, betterment fees for when uh, sewer water lines are extended. Um, uh, and I, I think that needs to be considered uh, because we think extending a, a sewer line because of a failure in a subdivision is an expensive process and those homes are worth more once they're on sewer or water. Um, I was surprised at how many um, private water and sewer, uh, how much uh, miles of pipe private uh, water and sewer owned in town. Uh, so the newer modified service piece needs to be looked at, the adjudication appeal piece needs to be looked at. And the other thing that's not in the regs and it's not Guilford's ch challenge is we don't have a septic system maintenance program. Um, and I, I, I think that the town should look at implementing something like that because it's a way of preventing 
than it needs to extend uh, sewer lines. So that's uh, that's my two cents. Thank you. Sean. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so Guilford, it's is it correct that these regs are still under review and being modified based on all the feedback that you're receiving? Is that accurate? Yes, the, the TSO didn't the TSO didn't get through the water regulation, so we, they haven't even started talking about the sewer regulations. So we didn't so maybe, finish. So maybe as a suggested next step, um, and because May is such a busy month, I think Kathy and Andy, if you think it's okay, um, if people want to send their input or feedback, Bob, I've already forwarded your um, your feedback to Gil Guilford and Amy. We may want to bring this back in June or whenever um, Amy and Guilford think a, ne a next version is ready to um, review. And we can submit, give the feedback to them now so that they can factor that into their whatever their next version is. That that sounds that that sounds like the right approach. And we could at this point move to the next item on the agenda if and thank Amy and Guilford for joining us. Um, because they will be back for water and sewer rates. We're going to see them soon. <laughs> thank you both very much. You're welcome. Bye. Andy, what do you want to take back sharing? Or should I continue? No, why don't you continue? Okay, so the what we were trying to stretch the time to cover was uh, if we could get to it, rental rate registration fee, but also to be talking about um, assignments for people taking different parts of the budget, which is what we're going to be starting to meet next week. Um, and I see Matt's hand is up. And one suggestion, if we can't get through both, was to move rental registration fee to one of the slots, create room in the one of the May meetings. We have to make a decision by May 16th. So Matt, do you, let, let me just call on Matt to, uh, since his hand is up. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I apologize. I cannot stay uh, until 1120, but I just wanted to say that I did review the memo and if that goes up for a vote that I do support the rental registration um, proposal. And then I would also be um, more than happy to take on any assignments as the, uh, as appropriate. I don't know if that's within the, the non-voting members um, scope, but I'm happy to do it. Um, if, if you'd like okay absolutely and if you if there is a place you're particularly interested in matt just let let andy know i mean we each take on things that either we want to learn more about or we're interested in anyway so okay. thank you wonderful michelle we also have to discuss the hearing before we finish today so right. i just want to make sure we confirm that because it does change things So I, I guess I'm looking for is the discussion on the rental fee registration. If people have read it, is this a fairly short discussion and we can move the item because Rob Moore is with us. Um, and if so, then we, I'm, what, it's about 11.05 by my, and Michelle said she has a hard stop in 20 minutes or should we just move to parsing out the budget? So Sean, you're raising your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say something real quick about that. Um, um, and I think Andy said this in his email and that's what he was trying to describe. So with the rental registration fee, there's sort of two parts. There's the proposed um, fee increase. And um, I think Rob has looked at those, those numbers already. I think the numbers make sense. Um, in terms of the math of the numbers. Um, I looked at it quickly, it seemed to make sense. Um, so I think there's one thing for the finance committee to review that. And I don't know what your recommendation would be on that, but um, the math seems to make sense. There's the second piece about the staffing um, and how those revenues would support additional staffing. Um, and I think that's the piece that would require, um, it may not be required in order for a recommendation to go to the council, but um, we don't generally assign revenues to specific departments. So just because there's an increase in revenues in the inspection department, it doesn't translate to Rob, here you go, here's, you know, here's that money, go hire staff. There, you know, we still have to fit additional staff within the town's operating budget. Um, so I think that's one thing I just want to clarify in that memo kind of makes it seem like if this department revenues go up, we can just add 
staffing in that department, but that's not how our practices are. Um, if, we, if it was that way, things would be really chaotic in terms of assigning revenues to specific departments. Um, so that's not to say that uh, the town manager, if there's a bylaw that requires more inspections, the town manager wouldn't have to figure out how to address that bylaw. Um, but I just wanna be clear that it is sort of decoupled in terms of the revenue goes up on one side, it doesn't necessarily mean the expenses are going up on the other side. It sounds like we have started a discussion on rental fees. So um, maybe we can, did, did any, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a quick clarification. It was, and I don't have the document in front of me because I had to move. It was it's sitting on my desk uh, two, two floors up, but um, did, there was an inspection fee, I think of $150. Was that per unit? or per going into a building. In other words, if you went into a building to do inspections and there were three units versus one unit, is it 450 or 150? Rob? Yes, yeah, so we currently do not have any uh, fee for an inspection. So we, when we're responding to a complaint or conducting an inspection, uh, you know, we're, we're we're not able to charge a fee. Uh, this is gonna be, this would create an opportunity for us to do that. And I think at this time, because the bylaw doesn't require an inspection, it's complaint response. It's gonna give us the opportunity on reoccurring um, issues with properties to uh, be able to charge a fee to that property owner uh, as part of the, you know, the, 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 the effort to, bring better compliance to that property. Uh, so it could be per unit, it could be per inspection, depending on exactly what the situation is. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions about, we have just the fee fees being proposed and later on there will be a larger look at permitting, but this was to start the process, Andy. Yeah, I, uh, the, the question, though, of whether it is uh, per unit probably does need to be clarified and put into the, uh, the policy that the council is going to ultimately pass, because you can't leave that kind of vagueness out there. It's got to it's got to be incorporated. Michelle. I could just add that as an original sponsor working on this, our intention right now for this sort of temporary structure um, was for that to be just on complaint. Um, as we continue to work on this and we have a new bylaw, which will have a new fee structure, um, looking at other communities, it's clear that most of them are actually by unit um, and the inspection costs are usually baked into that uh, fee. So this was really uh, at least initially intended to be by complaint. Jennifer. Um, I mean, just to add that uh, the re uh, residential rental property bylaw is now, as you all know, at, in the, at CRC and as part of revising that bylaw, this the fee structure will also be a part of that. So this is really a request we wanted to get for there to be the opportunity to um, bring in more revenue in fiscal year 2023, although we may propose another fee structure the following year as part of the revised bylaw. Other comments or questions on this? And I, I guess the larger question is if we bring the motion up, um, this was approved by TSO. Um, so the question is, are we ready to vote on the proposed fees to recommend? Um, um, Michelle is saying, Sue, does someone wanna make a motion then? Lynn, go uh, for it. Lynn. I'm, the only problem is I need to see the memo. Um, so I move that the finance committee recommend to the town council approval of the motion of the fees, rental fees as proposed. 
And I second that. Second. Okay, I am going to go around the room. Andy, is that a comment or are you ready to vote? No, I still think we have the problem that needs to be resolved as to whether the uh, the hundred and fifty dollar inspection fee is that um, if the inspection if if robbers um, staff go out to one building that has multiple units are they is the fee one hundred and fifty dollars for the entire visit or is it one hundred and fifty dollars per unit within the building? And I don't know how you could uh, impose a fee structure without clarification as to what the fee is that's being imposed. Rob? Uh, I would suggest that based on the language being proposed that we would likely look at that per inspection. And if we, if we were responding to an issue that required looking at more than one unit, we'd have to make the decision, can we do that in one inspection or do we need to break that up into multiple inspections? So I think having that flexibility is okay. Um, you know, it's, it's probably not unusual to uh, look at a multi-unit building and be looking at maybe just the common areas and not necessarily have to charge, you know, three inspections of a three unit building just because there's three units. So for that reason, I wouldn't want to specify per unit. And I think I think the per unit inspection for the purposes of this level of um, where we are with the bylaw in, in you know, uh, basing it off of the current regulation, I think it'll probably work okay and, and give us the option to decide if uh, we need to, need to create multiple inspections over time, say as a, um, a way to monitor a property that is having issues. Dorothy. Well, this issue is very important at TSO. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about equity, small owners, um, and large buildings. And the understanding was that uh, although the fees are very close right now uh, between for like one to six units and a large property with many units, that that was going to be remedied when uh, the inspections were more consistent. So. Um, because it, there, there was a very strong feeling in, in terms of passing the uh, bylaw that's going to come. The TSO had a great concern that there be a difference in funding in fees and expenses between smaller properties and larger properties. So uh, I, I understand Rob's point about um, you need flexibility, but I, I think it'll have to be defined a little bit more than that. Well, as I understand it, this is per inspection right now. So if you're called out, you're doing an inspection um, as opposed to the permit fee or the registration fee itself. So, uh, Rob. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that, that, you know, when or if the bylaw ever does get revised, that has a mandatory inspection requirement, some sort of periodic inspection of the units, the fee schedule would have to be looked at completely differently than what, what is being proposed here today. This is not at all intended to address that type of a bylaw or that type of a program. It wouldn't work. Uh, and so this is really just about our ability to go in responding to complaints and decide if you know it's an issue that requires us to charge an inspection fee. Uh, and, and this is really, you know, my thought of this is for the 30 to 40 properties that we deal with regularly reoccurring problems and trying to gain compliance and spending a lot of time at those parcel properties, this will give us the opportunity to charge fees appropriately for that work. So uh, is, are the, is the committee ready to vote? And Andy, I think what's been answered is this is per inspection and it's on a, it's, it's in this, in this instance, it's been prompted by a call. Um, you know, uh, it's in response to a complaint. So we're not talking about general inspections of larger multi-units. So. Yeah, I, I, I think um, Rob's provided a good answer and it, it's defined as per inspection. If he has a way of uh, interpreting it so that nobody will come back and accuse him 
of being inconsistent or in violation of the policy. And he's comfortable with it, then I think we're fine. Then I am going to, I think we had a, a motion made and seconded, so then I'm going to call a vote. Um, Lynn? Aye. Kathy is a yes. Michelle? Yes. Elisha? Yes. Andy? Yes. Rob? Bob? I support. <laughs> and uh, Bernie? I think Rob's going to be accused of being inconsistent regardless. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he's probably used to it. Uh, I support this. Thank you. So it passes unanimously with one non-voting member absent. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for joining us. And we now have, I could, we now have the witching hour for Michelle. Um, she said she needed, she had a hard stop at 1120, but we have the, um, people taking assignments and then the issue of hearing. So it's, it's, it's the setting of the hearing date. Is that what we were supposed to be recommending? And Lynn, what are our choices? Two options, the, the issue rose last night during the meeting uh, by, raised by Councillor Haneke that all other committees that have been designated to do hearings do them during their committee time. Right now, the hearing for the Finance Committee for the FY23 budget is scheduled for the 16th. One option is to do that hearing separately at 5.30 or 5 or 5.30. Uh, I actually would suggest even 5, even though it might mean we have a break. And then um, that we also looked at the option of having that hearing on May 9th, which is presently not scheduled as a town council meeting. Personally, I would just as soon do the five o'clock on May 16th. Um, I certainly would too, uh, given the other meetings I have those weeks. Um, is that, is there any opposition to having that be the time for time and date for hearings? So I'm hearing the recommendation is to have to conduct our hearing on the 16th, which is a Monday, and it would be before the council meeting at potentially at five. Um, is there agreement on that? Anyone in objection? Okay, so I think that's our recommendation. Thank you. I think the next item, I want, as we go to assignments, I just want Alicia to weigh in whether she has now been able to arrange her schedule to be at the meetings in May of the Finance Committee. Alicia? Um, hi, yes, sorry, thank you for giving me the time. Sorry, also I'm with my child, so that's why I'm not on camera. But um, so I still have not actually gotten a final answer as to whether or not because my work schedule is being arranged. So currently I can still make the next meeting, but I'm not sure about all the rest moving forward because I haven't gotten my new work schedule. Okay, thank you. So Andy, we're, um, the, the, the last item then was for people to uh, take on different departments. And since we are basically out of time, one thing we could do is if, People want to quickly say if they have a preferred department right now. If not, you could send out a list and have people just make choices um, based on the list. Um, Sean, can you put the schedule up? Mm -hmm. Sorry to cut in, just wondering what exactly is it that we do when we take an assignment? Okay, just I can describe it if you, what you do is you take on yourself to read the proposed budget. And if you have questions, you draft the questions and get them to Sean in advance so that the departments, to the extent they can, can see some of the questions. And then later on, when we write this up, you can write the short paragraph or the longer paragraph um, about it. So you're sort of taking on thinking about it in more depth, you're gonna see this budget document is quite long. Um, and, and so that, that's what it is. Uh, but you know, most of us, all of us will usually read all of it, but then it's a question of focusing more in a particular area. 
I'll Kathy, take. Can I, can I add to that real quick? Yeah. yeah. Um, just so people have a sense of what are the categories. So it's not this granular um, in terms of what you'd sign up for. So in the past, we would have one member do general government, which would include all the departments within general government. Th those would be the ones that you would focus on. Um, somebody would do public work. Someone would do public safety. Someone would do planning and inspections um, and conservation. And somebody would do community services. And then in addition to that, we somebody would focus on um, either all the enterprise funds or we would split up the enterprise funds. And then we'd have somebody on the library and somebody on the schools, uh, the elementary schools. So those are, I don't know if there's seven or eight of those, but those are the main categories um, that would be assigned to each person on the committee or one person on the committee would be assigned to each of those. So Kathy, I will take the 19th, which includes public works and water, sewer, transportation, and solid waste. And Michelle, if you look at that, you see what John has just done. And of course he's done it in setting these up. Those clusters are per day as well. You know, so if you take the 17th, you get a cluster of um, first responders, public Thank health, you. public welfare. Yeah. What ones are the what day is the community services? Which one was that is May 17th. Chris, you mean? No, no. Um, so I'm interested in like down here, the human resources, um, the diversity, equity and inclusion, the, the that would be that's, general that, government. That's that's the 24th. That's May 24th. OK, is anyone else want to fight me for that no. one? Or? No, I'll help you though with the council <laughs> and town manager since I wrote the council section. Perfect. Okay. Right. Who so wants we to? Have, we have public I safety. Can take, I can take the ones at the on the, the conservation planning at the bottom of the list there. If that's mm -hmm. one one chunk. I'll do public safety. That's the 17th, right? Um, maybe maybe Matt would yes. do the schools. <laughs> yeah, no, if Matt would do the schools, it'd be great, right? So we have maybe. library left. Um, and then we have a couple enterprise funds left. Well, why don't I why don't I do the uh, why don't I do the library? I can, uh, I did the, this, I've done the enterprise funds in the past. So what's left, Sean? Uh, sorry, we have community services left too, which oh, is sorry. like the, rec the recreation department, um, Cherry Hill, the pools, senior center, public health. Sean, where do you have enterprise funds or it's up in water sewer? So, so Linter, water, Linter, water, Linter, yeah. yeah, water and sewer <laughs> makes sense to go with public works because they're all Guilford. Mm -hmm. um, but the other two enterprise funds that could be separated yeah. out are transportation, yeah. And um, solid waste. And solid waste. So somebody could take those too if they wanted to take those as a cluster. Did anyone take community services? Bernie, were you taking that one? Bernie took I library. Took, would oh. take the library. So we still oh, have Andy that needs to take something um, and Alicia. So we have what? Police Communication Center, Fire and EMS, Crest, Public Health, Senior Center, and Veterans. So that's all under, so community services is the, is the cluster that we need to go next. And that would include the recreation department, Cherry Hill, the pool, senior center. Um, that would, that cuts across a couple of days. Um, it's the 12th and the 17th when most of that is discussed. Alicia has her hand raised. Alicia, I'd be happy, to, I'd be happy to take that one. Community services, okay. All right, so, so then the last one, I think, unless I'm missing something, would be transportation and solid waste. Um, and if Andy was open to taking that, then we would be, I think everybody I would already, have an assignment. No, I already took those. Yeah, well, you, you, took sewer, you took sewer, water, and public works. She actually no. took May 19th. She took you, the whole day. If you, want, if you want the whole day, take it. If you want all of it, you can. <laughs> they're, they're, just, they're distinct enough. If you want to break them off and, and let Andy take them, you can. Um, but if you don't want to, Fine. Nope, I'll take them. Okay, so then Andy is without currently. So 
Um, he's the chair, so that gives him time to plan for and the report. And what are inspections and facilities and police facility under? Uh, so facilities, um, regular facilities is under general government. So that would fall under Michelle. Okay. Police facilities, it's technically under public safety, but it will likely be also under general government because Jeremiah will speak to that one. Um, I think if we could mail out a list with our assignments attached. I, to yeah, with the dates. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Um, and then inspections, planning, conservation, that's all Bob um, under conservation development. Mm -hmm. And I think I took all of May 17th, but uh, Alicia might have taken part of it. So we can we can talk about that later. Yeah, so you, Kathy, you'll have the first three, the public safety items, um, okay. police communications, fire EMS and CRESS. Okay, because then there's public health and senior center and veterans. If you need to, I can take them all. I, I know I know those yeah. areas. I don't, but, I don't but, think it has to go by day. Um, yeah. So the, the goal here is that yeah. when you get the budget document, the clusters will be more or less together. And so you're gonna be yeah. focused on that cluster and generating questions. Um, if they're on different days, I don't think it's the end of the world. Okay. Then I think we are, uh, we got through the agenda, amazingly. Um, Kathy, we haven't done public comment. We haven't done public comment. So that was the one and I don't see any public. Um, okay. So more, that, so <laughs> the, the one person that was there has, has left. Uh, Lynn has her hand up and uh, I think, yeah, go on. I just want to apologize that on the second, starting at 1030, I'm going to be trying to plug in by phone and in a multiple person vehicle. So I, I have no May, way to avoid that. May 2nd? Um, May 2nd. Yeah. That, um, that's Monday. No, I, I meant the third. Third. Okay. May 3rd. So I just want to apologize in advance for not having people feel like I'm not as connected as I should be. Thank you. Then I think we've actually done next agenda items, um, you know, looking for to the future, which was listed here. So I think we've actually finished today's meeting. Um, and I'm ready to adjourn the meeting of the finance committee. And Lynn, I guess you have to adjourn the council. I'm going to adjourn the meeting of the council at 11.30, no, actually 11.28. And I will adjourn the meeting of the finance committee at the same time, 11.28. Yeah, and, uh, Lynn and Sean, I should uh, report back to you a little bit on the MMA discussion at some point. Okay. okay. I, have I, to can stay, to a, I can I have stay on, but... You know, Sean, you have to hop off. Yeah, um, let me make sure you're, if you want to stay on, we just got to make sure you're a host. No, we can, we can uh, I, I, I need to let you know too, so I'll okay. follow up. We'll uh, find for, another time. But because um, yeah. um, some of it was following up on a conversation we had with Jackie some time ago. All right. I okay. pushed that issue hard. Thank Great. you, everyone. Bye, guys. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye.